Okay, so this is Renaissance politics, or if you prefer, why great art doesn't beat cannons. Um, the purpose of, of, of this of this presentation is to sort of introduce the the big players and the big themes uh, in the international political arena during the Renaissance. And by the Renaissance, I mostly mean the end of the Renaissance, uh, the sort of end of the 15th century, beginning of the 16th century, um, where the politics becomes uh, more and more like what we think of as, as modern Europe. So this, of course, is Europe in essentially 1500. Um, it's got some plot layers that look pretty familiar to us. England, France, Spain, sort of, all kind of look like what we would uh, are used to them looking like. Uh, and some others that seem um, uh, quite foreign to, to 21st century eyes. Uh, uh, obviously, you no know, Germany, instead, the Holy Roman Empire. Um, Italy is not Italy the state, but a collection of small city-states. Uh, the Ottoman Empire is a very important and uh, very powerful looming presence in the East, etc. Uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to go over the uh, um, the main players uh, in in the story of uh, the the fifteenth and, and sixteenth century, um, and, and we're going to look at a few big themes. Um, but most importantly, we're going to be looking at the, the initial efforts to centralize states, to bring the diffuse states that, that were the, the norm during the feudal medieval era and, and watch as they either succeed in centralizing and becoming more powerful or they fail and suffer the consequences thereof. This is going to be one of the very big themes of uh, the first and, and even to the second semester of our course. So, so we're going to be looking at that, that sort of centralization versus failure to centralize um, a, a, a lot. Um, the, the principal players that we're going to be looking at here are uh, first the, 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 the five different major uh, city-states within the Italian peninsula, then uh, France, England, the Holy Roman Empire, uh, Spain, or what is going to become Spain, um, and then some cameos, perhaps from a few others as we as we go. So um, with that, let's start with Italy. Um, Italy, uh, the, the, the home of the Renaissance, the the beneficiary of its location, the beneficiary of the intense competition between its different city-states, the beneficiary of the economic uh, uh, conflict and cooperation. But ironically, the, the, the fragmentation that served Italy so well uh, as it benefited from, from Renaissance uh, co uh, co competition is the very thing which is going to cause Italy a lot of trouble in, in the course of our story today. Um, so, so beginning at the southernmost tip of the peninsula, we have the kingdom of Naples uh, or Napoli. Now, Napoli is the largest of the main Italian states, and it's large, but it is relatively poor. Uh, the reason for this is that it, 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 Naples... Um, is the part of Italy where feudalism put down the deepest roots and where feudalism uh, hangs on the longest. Most of the Italian peninsula is not really feudal in the way that the rest of uh, Western Europe is, um, but, but Naples is. Uh, what this means is that uh, Naples uh, does not have um, all the benefits of the Renaissance uh, economic changes. It doesn't trade as much. It, it doesn't have uh, the kind of large cities that incubate the Renaissance. Um, and so uh, it, it, Naples, while it's very large and, and is, is important, it may not be as 
uh, wealthy or as powerful as some of its other uh, Italian competitors. In, in part because of uh, Naples' uh, relative backwardness, um, it is often the place that other uh, other powers fight over. Um, Aragon, which is one of the Spanish kingdoms, one of the kings of the Italian peninsula, uh, has ties to uh, to Napoli and, and uh, often uh, had control over over Naples. Um, and we're going to see that Naples is going to become a battleground for other important European powers during the course of our story. Uh, next, moving up the uh, up the boot. Uh, we come to the Papal States. Now, the Papal States um, are centered in Rome and the Vatican, and they are, of course, called the Papal States because they are under the control, at least nominally, of the Pope. Um, uh, the, there are a couple of important points about this. Um, the first is that you see the Papal States are, are, are quite large. Um, this is a, a, a swath of uh, very... Uh, a valuable central Italian territory, um, and the Papal States are not just a religious or spiritual power, uh, the way you would you would expect uh, the, the Vat from the from the Vatican. You know, as a modern person, um, but they are also a, a significant temporal power with wealth, with armies, with taxes, governments. Uh, the Pope is very much a, um, a, 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 a religious and a temporal power. Um, but there are some caveats to this. Um, one is that the, the Papal States are nominally under the control of the Pope, but very often not really completely. Um, areas that are supposedly loyal or part of the Papal States are pretty much doing what they want uh, in active rebellion or defiance or not paying their taxes or whatnot. So the control of the Pope over the lands of the Papal States sort of waxes and wanes depending on uh, the fortunes of time and the skill of the particular Pope. Speaking of the particular Popes, this is another important thing. The Pope, the, 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 the job of being Pope is an elected office. Uh, the cardinals, who are like the, uh, the nobility of the church, um, uh, whenever one pope dies, they will gather and they will elect the next pope. And it's always from the ranks of the cardinals. So there'll be you know, roughly 20 people and they'll get together and they'll decide who gets to be the next big dude. Um, while you'd like to think that they make their selections based on uh, who would be the best leader of the church. The fact is these popes are typically elected for their political skills uh, or their ability to uh, lobby and or bribe and or threaten uh, the, their fellow cardinals to get themselves elected as pope. Um, so, so sometimes this ends up with a, uh, a pope who is a uh, a religious man and who does the best he can to, to run the church as a religious institution. Other times you get guys who are popes because they like the power part of it and the religious part doesn't really interest them all that much. Um, and so you have extreme stories of uh, Renaissance popes who were using the office as a way to indulge themselves and their mistresses and their bastard offsprings and their, and, uh, and their families and um, it's one of the things, the sort of the, the story of, of, of these popes and how some of them were very corrupt uh, is one of the things that is going to break down the, the authority and the respect that the church has held in. So, uh, uh, but, you know, as, 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 we, as we begin our story at the, uh, in, the, in the 15th century, the papal states are still very much a power within Italy. As we move through this this story, we're going to see the the papacy or the papal states really reduced in their significance, and sort of from that point forward, the pope is less and less of a temple figure, more and more of a religious spiritual figure only. 
A little further north, but closely related to the Papal States, is the Republic of Florence, blessed with a wonderful location between Rome, the Papal States, and the rest of Italy and, and Western Europe. Um, this puts Florence in a wonderful position to benefit from the trade and the money that flows in and out of Rome. Um, and so trade and banking with Rome make Florence rich. Very, very rich. Uh, it is nominally a republic, but it comes to be dominated in the 15th century by the Medici family. Uh, Cosimo and then Lorenzo the Magnificent, uh, pictured here, who were uh, your classic Renaissance men, guys who made huge money um, uh, in, in banking uh, and really came to run Florence. So again, supposedly a republic, but really uh, run by these guys, by this particular family. And um, they, they use their wealth and their power to build Florence into a truly amazing city. Florence is one of those just stunningly beautiful places with architecture, buildings, sculpture, really that you, 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 you can't believe. Um, so when, when you think of the Renaissance and you think of art and all that, you, 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 many times you think of Florence first. Um, so, so Florence um, sits uh, um, uh, as, a, as, a, as one of the most powerful, mo uh, uh, best situated Italian states, um, but that will change. Uh, incidentally, Florence is also the uh, setting for the Assassin's Creed II video game, uh, which was based on a real historical event, the uh, Pezzi Conspiracy, uh, which was a, a group of Italian noblemen, with the, uh, with the blessing of the Pope, tried to assassinate uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, uh, and uh, the, assass the assassination failed. One of, the, one of his relatives was killed by the assassins. Uh, this led to a horrible uh, uh, feud, bloody, bloody feud um, between the Medici and, and, and these other Italians. Um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Pope was furious. The Pope tried to have, uh, have the Medici, yeah, tried to excommunicate uh, essentially the entire city of Florence. Uh, it, it became a heck of a standoff um, and, and a pretty good story and that's the basis and uh, the basis for a, a pretty good video game. Uh, next we have the Duchy of Milan up on the sort of northeastern edge of Italy. Um, Milan is wealthy. Milan is powerful. It doesn't perhaps have quite as much trade or financial strength as, for example, Florence. Um, but it is a center of early manufacturing and industry. Um, Milan produces and makes things. Um, it trades. Uh, incidentally, this, this manufacturing trend continues to this day. Um, Milan and the area around it is the heartland of the Italian industrial region, uh, and they still produce things there. Um, Milan um, it, it, it has one of the uh, sort of colorful stories of governance. It, it was um, it, it's it's nominally a duchy, which means it's ruled by the duke. Um, it was taken over, really sort of conquered by a mercenary general, a, a, a certain kind of soldier called the Condottiere, um, who's essentially a mercenary with his own, uh, his own troops. Um, he was hired by Milan, and then he used that uh, to, to take over the place and throw his employers out and make himself ruler of the city. Uh, his name was Francesco Sforza. Uh, he founds the, the House of Sforza. Um, and he goes from being a mercenary to a signore, which is essentially uh, the big man in charge of, uh, in charge of the city. Um, uh, this is a picture of uh, Francesco Sforza um, that he had after he made himself a duke. Uh, you can see he's wearing this sort of beat up 
soldier's hat. Um, he wanted himself painted that way to, well, depending on your perspective, you could, you could say he's keeping it real, reminding, you know, staying in touch with his roots, or you could say that he wanted everyone who looked at the picture to remember that he was first and foremost a soldier, and he had a lot of guys with sharp sticks who would do exactly what he told them to do. So uh, Milan sits um, uh, as one of the powers. Notice, though, that because it is up on the corner of Italy, it is the one closest to France, and that is going to be an issue. Uh, finally, for our Italian players, we look at the, the Republic of Venice. Um, Venice was, in some sense, the, the, the first of the Italian states to emerge. Uh, it became very rich. You know, by the, by the 12th century, Venice had become very wealthy uh, by being a, a maritime trader. Um, Venetian ships would trade with, uh, with the Eastern Mediterranean, with Constantinople, um, with, you know, with access to the network that brought uh, goods in from Asia. And you can see they would distribute them uh, in and around Europe. Uh, and Venice for a long time has a sort of a semi-monopoly on that, uh, jealously guarded. The Venetians are um, uh, ruled by a, a merchant aristocrat oligarchy. They were these merchant families that were very powerful. Uh, they sort of kept control of the sea tightly within their own order in a very uh, complicated and impossible for outsiders to understand political system. Um, and the Venetians are sort of famously unprincipled. Um, they will trade with anybody for anything, um, and we're always, always looking for their own advantage, sort of famously uh, uh, willing to sell anything. Uh, at one point, a bunch of uh, people who wanted to go on crusades, so Holy Land came and, and uh, hired the Venetians to provide shipping for them to get them across the Mediterranean to Jerusalem, and the Venetians... Uh, took their money, put them on ships, and then sold the whole lot of them into slavery <laughs> rather than deliver them. So, you know, not necessarily nice guys, but very, very effective. Um, Venice, though, is, is threatened by the new Europe. Um, the, the wealth and power of Venice um, is a product, really, of the Middle Ages, and as we move into the Renaissance, with these new powers arising, with, with France and Spain and the Holy Roman Empire, the other Italian city-states, all of these are looking to take action to the steps that are going to cause problems um, for Venice. And, and so Venice is in a somewhat precarious position um, as, we, as we move through the, the 15th century. Okay, so that's, those are our five Italian states. Now let's look at some of the, um, the, the European powers that we need to talk about. Um, we'll, and we'll start with France. Um, France um, uh, ha had gone through the, the Hundred Years' War, um, which was a, you know, a, a disaster in, in many ways. And these... These maps uh, sort of just show how uh, the, 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 the control, the power of England spread. This is the green color, and you can see how it goes from a, a few tiny little coastal enclaves, and then it gets larger and larger. And France, you know, before Joan of Arc shows up, is really being pushed back and shrunk and, and is at, perhaps at risk of of losing its status as a, as, a, as a real power. But ultimately, England loses, and the, the, the final map there uh, indicates how England was, was pushed off the continent. France reasserts its power, um, and, and it, you know, this, once France wins the Hundred Years' War, it's going to begin a period of centuries where France is one of the, if not the major European continental power. Um, um, but, but having said that, we really have to acknowledge that, in, uh, that it was badly beaten up by England during the Hundred Years' War. It had 
you know, it, it, its finances, its, its population, um, were, in, were in terrible condition. Um, however, however, um, under Charles VII, uh, the French King Charles VII, France was able to, uh, to drive England from the continent. That happens in 1453, really the end of the war. Um, and, and Charles VII is the first of the, what we're going to call the new monarchs. These are the guys who we're going to see asserting centralized power. Uh, Charles VII is, is, the, is the new monarch who brings France victory, um, who tries to stabilize French finances, um, uh, and he critically establishes a standing royal army. Uh, remember that in the medieval model, um, uh, armies were uh, you know, sort of diffused and scattered and, and kings had to call on nobles to provide their, their feudal forces. Charles VII says, to hell with that, I'm going to have my own army. I'm going to have enough money that I can keep them on call, ready to act on an on a essentially permanent basis. Um, it was halting at first. It was not terribly large, but he has his own army, and that's a very big deal. Um, so Charles VII uh, manages to, uh, um, to, to, uh, to to really improve France's condition. He is succeeded by Louis XI, um, who has a great nickname, the Universal Spider. And I love this this painting of him. He's got his little his little hipster hat there, and uh, and you know he looks kind of like some. Uh, Brooklyn mob boss or something, but he is renowned, uh, Louis XI, for his cunning, for his intrigue, um, and, and his ability to, to scheme at France's benefit. Um, so Louis uses that army that he inherited from his father, uh, Charles uh, VII. Uh, uh, he uses that army to control his nobles, which is a critical element of being a new monarch. Uh, when you're, if you're going to centralize power, you're centralizing power at the expense of the nobility. Uh, so he takes that power, uh, takes, it, takes that army, he uses it uh, against the foreign enemies of France, but also against his own nobles. And he is able to expand French territory. Um, uh, the The... Uh, on, on this map, you can sort of see just how, how far he goes. Um, the light purple is sort of where he begins, but the darker purple and the striped purple are territories that Louis adds to France, either through direct military power or through marriage or diplomacy or intrigues, uh, whatever it takes. Um, so while Louis XI uh, may, may not have been... Uh, the, the nicest or most beloved of monarchs, he was very effective. Um, uh, he is succeeded by his son, Charles VIII, who almost gives it all away. Uh, more about him later. Um, but um, ultimately, uh, Francis I, um, who, who reigns in the 16th century, is going to be able to uh, reassert French power, to establish France as, as, as a really mighty, mighty country. And as an example of that, Francis I is going to be able to essentially force the Pope into an agreement in 1516 called the Concordat of Bologna. Um, what that basically says is that the, the King of France has the ability to select who gets to be a bishop in France, who the abbots are going to be, who controls the church lands in France. This essentially means that the French crown controls the important parts of the Catholic Church in France, uh, which gives them access to a lot of money, a lot of power. And, and so uh, this is sort of another example of, of a new monarch centralizing authority, a monarch who is strong enough to be able to force, in this case, a foreign prince, the Pope, to give up something because within France, the French king is going to be the most powerful entity. So that's, that's France. Uh, 
uh, although, as I said, we're going to come back to Charles VIII. Meanwhile, across the channel in England, um, again, you know, at the height of the Hundred Years' War, England has these huge continental holdings shown in red. But when England is ultimately defeated in 1453, that's going to have profound implications. It is going to push England off the continent, and England thereafter sees itself as an island nation, as a nation separate and apart from England. You know, we think of England as being an island, and obviously separate and apart from Europe, somehow different than Europe, and that's how the English see themselves. But, you know, that doesn't have to have turned out that way. Um, there are part, there are, there are nations separated by water uh, that still think of themselves as being part of the same state. Oh, talk about, let's say, Hawaii or Alaska. I mean, we clearly think of those as being part of the United States. Um, it's, there's no reason that England could not have considered itself part of the continent and have had English territory on the continent. Um, it didn't happen. And that means that England goes down its own certain slightly separate path. Another very important consequence um, of, uh, the, of the English defeat in the, war, uh, in, in the Hundred Years' War is the crisis that leads to the War of the Roses. Um, the, the, uh, the tremendous expense, the very high taxes, the assertion of royal authority that happened during the Hundred Years' War causes the English aristocracy, the English nobility, to be very unhappy. And so we get the War of the Roses, which is essentially a civil war amongst uh, and between the English nobles over what the king is going to be able to do and who is going to control the king. Well, who gets to be the king? What family? Uh, and there are two principal families, uh, the, the House of Lancaster, the Red, the House of York, uh, the White. Um, and these two slug it out for decades uh, with different sides coming on, different guys being made king. It looks like uh, the House of York wins under Richard III. This is Richard III of the very famous and most excellent Shakespeare play. Um, uh, Richard III looks like he's won. It looks like he has routed all of the, all of the Lancaster forces and it looks like he will now be able to centralize power in England, but he can't. He cannot break the power of the English nobility. And this kind of upstart named uh, Henry Tudor, who is from a, a sort of minor branch of the House of Lancaster, Henry Tudor, uh, who has been hiding out in exile in France, um, uh, he crosses the channel with the help of the French and Louis XI, the universal spider, remember, always intriguing, always looking for ways to get one up. Henry Tudor crosses the English Channel with a relatively small force. Uh, he invades England and he wins. You know, I mean, Richard III is the king. He seems to have the most power. He seems to be well in control. Henry comes across and, and on this sort of long shot, wins and takes over England and makes himself king. The reason he's able to pull this off is, is not necessarily that Henry is, is such a brilliant genius general or anything, um, but that Richard is betrayed by his nobles. The very powerful English aristocracy don't like Richard all that much. They, they think maybe he's becoming too powerful. Uh, they don't trust him. And so they betray him. Um, and at the, fam at, the, at the famous Battle of Bosworth Field, several of the English nobility who had brought their troops to fight with Richard betray him, and they flip sides and they fight with Henry. Uh, and that leads to the death of Richard III, uh, which then leads to the brilliant Shakespeare play. Um, Henry, this, Henry, then, Henry Tudor then becomes Henry VII, uh, and he establishes the Tudor dynasty, and the Tudor dynasty is now going to rule England for... Uh, about 100 years. So let's uh, pay attention uh, to England. We'll come back to this, I promise. By the way, in case any of you are fans of HBO and or 
George R. R. Martin, The War of the Roses has some not coincidental similarities with the Game of Thrones. Um, uh, House of York, House of Stark, Lancaster, Lannister. I'm just saying. Uh, if you're a Game of Thrones person and you want to uh, poke around some of the War of Roses, and you'll find some some uh, rather obvious parallels that the author uh, stole. Okay, um, well now let's talk about Spain. Um, Spain, as we as we move into you know through the the 15th century, is in Spain. Uh, the Iberian Peninsula is actually a collection. Uh, of kingdoms. Um, it, it is not even entirely Christian. Um, Spain, uh, as, as you should know, was uh, conquered by uh, Islamic st uh, uh, states um, and had been ruled by Islamic overlords for, for centuries during the Middle Ages. They were sort of, they began to lose their control and they were pushed back uh, during parts of the Renaissance, but you know, as we're into the 15th century, there is still a significant uh, Arab Islamic ruler rulers in southern in the southern Iberian Peninsula. Um, you also have Portugal. You have the Kingdom of Aragon, the Kingdom of Castile, the Kingdom of Navarre. Spain um, is, is is very fragmented. However, in 1469. Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile were married, and it's a very dramatic story where uh, they, uh, they, were, they were the heirs to the respective kingdoms, and they wanted to get married for emotional and political reasons. They, people were trying to prevent them. They'd, they sneak out. They sort of meet and elope and, and, and get married. Um, and when they get married, they, they unify, sort of, the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon. Um, this is a marriage of, um, this is a unification, it's a political unification. The people of Castile and the people of Aragon do not think of themselves as united. They do not think of themselves as a single uh, state or, or, or kingdom. Um, so so it's, it's, it's more like a, a, a federation, um, but, uh, Isabella and Ferdinand definitely think of themselves as united. And once they're married, they get busy. Um, they have one of the uh, sort of longest and most interesting uh, royal partnerships uh, that you're going to see. Um, first, like, like, like all good new monarchs, they try and be, break up noble power, uh, asserting their royal authority against the powerful and very proud Spanish nobility. Um, uh, like uh, Francis I in Spain, they are powerful enough, they're strong enough to get the Pope to agree that they, as the king and queen, the monarchs of Spain, they will get to appoint the bishops and control the church lands in Spain. This gives them money. Uh, in 1492, as you know from three Spain three, uh, they defeat the last Muslim kingdom in Spain. This is the kingdom of Granada. Um, they, they, oh, they, they, they win the siege. Uh, they, they break down the walls. Um, and and the, the, the Muslim power in, in Spain is broken. Um, Columbus actually shows up in Granada uh, when he's looking for financing to do his ship, to, to go on his great journey. Um, and and uh, they approve, they, they give him the money, really kind of as an afterthought, uh, in the glow of having broken uh, Granada and, and having established Christian hegemony over Iberia. They're sort of like, oh, sure, let's indulge this crazy Italian while we're at it. We're feeling great. Um, uh, they then are going to go on to duel with France over the kingdom of Naples down in southern Italy. So stay tuned. That's coming up. Uh, all right. Um, uh, finally, as we go through our players, let's talk about the Holy Roman Empire. Um, the old 
historians joke about the Holy Roman Empire is that it was none of the above. It was neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. Uh, it was a very complicated and ancient state um, in more or less what we think of today as Germany, though it was far more than just Germany. But in the geographic area that we call Germany, there was instead something called the Holy Roman Empire. Um, the empire uh, was a, a kind of confederation of literally hundreds of different states, uh, duchies, principalities, bishoprics, uh, cities, baronies, all kinds of different things loosely organized into this framework um, and governed uh, or ruled sort of by the figure of the emperor who was an elected figure, but not elected by the common people, but elected by a small number of super big shots within the empire. These are called electors, a, a, a handful of, of dukes uh, and, and bishops who got together and were able to choose who the emperor was each time the old one died. Um, so the empire is, is large, it is powerful, but it, is also, it also has some, some very uh, interesting internal challenges. One of the questions is, will the Holy Roman Empire be able to centralize the way, let's say, France and Spain and England are? Um, so, so this is the uh, uh, Habsburg Emperor, the, the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, when we pick up our story, the Emperor Maximilian. Um, he uh, uh, is successful in some ways. He's from the House of Habsburg. We'll hear a lot about the Habsburgs. He does expand Habsburg power. He, he's able to uh, win some of these fights uh, that we're going to talk about. Uh, he is also able to marry his son, Philip the Handsome, to Joanna, who is the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, who we've already talked about. So uh, the Habsburgs, um, in, in some ways, were more effective at gaining power through marriage and diplomacy than through fighting. Uh, so so uh, Maximilian, uh, through this marriage, is able to bring together the Spanish Empire and the Holy Roman Empire into vast, vast holdings. Um, this when we, is going to be very important when we get to his son, Charles V, uh, and his son, Philip, uh, but stay tuned for that. Okay, so that's our players. Um, now let's talk about the Italian Wars and let's set the stage for it. Once again, Italy, 1494, um, and as you can see here, what we're talking about when we talk about the Italian Wars is a, a huge power struggle that involved all of these players that we've talked about, um, uh, and, and Italy is going to be the prize that they are dueling over. Um, so let's see how that starts. Um, it begins with the division that we've talked about as a strength and a weakness uh, within Italy. Naples and Florence are trying to do, basically do a deal. Uh, Naples and Florence agree that they are going to take on uh, Milan and each take a piece of Milanese territory. Uh, Duke Sforza of Milan is terrified of this. He's terrified of being uh, isolated. Remember the, the setup for Renaissance Italian politics was a sort of balance that nobody, uh, uh, whenever one state or two states looked to be too powerful, uh, the others would change their alliances and, and betray each other so that nobody ever got to be dominant within Italy. You know, if you were too weak, you found allies. If you were too strong, people ganged up on you. Milan, as we get to 1494, feels like it's on the outside, that, that uh, the Papal States and Venice are going to stand aside to allow Naples and Florence to carve it up. Sforza is terrified of this, and so he goes looking for an ally. He can't find any allies in Italy, so he turns to the nearest big player he can find, and that is France. Um, the new king of France in 1494 is Charles VIII. 
Charles VIII. Um, Charles VIII is nicknamed the affable or the friendly. Not exactly the kind of image you're usually going for when you're a Renaissance king. Um, he's, you know, opinions vary, but he's kind of a goof. Um, he's, he, he clearly means well. He seems to have been a pleasant guy. He just seemed to be a little bit nuts. Um, he is told by his advisors, who are some who are trying to manipulate him, that he is actually the rightful king of Naples, that his family has a claim to the throne of Naples way down in southern Italy, and one of the ceremonial titles that the king of Naples has is king of Jerusalem. This is what goes back to the Crusades. Now, of course, the king of Naples has no real authority or power in Jerusalem, but he has the title. Charles loves this. He thinks of himself as some kind of noble crusader. And so he decides that he is going to invade Naples to get to Jerusalem. Look at the map. This is a crazy plan. But that was his idea. Go to Naples, become the king of Naples, and then continue on to assert to his own crusade into the Holy Land. Uh, to set this up, he has to give away huge chunks that his father, uh, uh, Louis XI, and his grandfather, uh, uh, Charles the, VII, had gained. He, they, he, he pays a huge amount of money to England and to Spain and to all of them, all to sort of protect his flanks to make sure that they're not going to bother him while he goes south and pursues Jerusalem. So, in 1494, he marches south through Italy. He marches through Milan, through Florence, through the Papal States to get to Naples. And you would think that if a French king and a French army is barging his way through Italy, that the Italians might object, but they really don't. Um, they don't stop him for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're not united. They, they cannot pull their act together and all say, we're going to stop this French invader. Um, and because they don't have cannons. Italy at this point has all those beautiful medieval castles with the high walls and, and all like that. Charles has high-tech weaponry. He's got those cannons, which we've talked about. The Italians really don't because they haven't centralized. They don't have that kind of... Uh, centralized wealth. Um, and so Charles is able to basically cruise down the Italian Peninsula without fighting a battle. The Italians essentially give up, roll over, get out of his way. He goes all the way down into Naples, and he conquers it. Again, pretty much without a battle. He proclaimed himself king of Naples, and, you know, here's Mr. Hannigan sneering at him as being kind of a goof, but it worked! The problem is that it doesn't last. Um, he, he's able to conquer Naples, but he can't hold it. And so <laughs> Charles comes to a rather unfortunate, uh, if slightly comic, end. Um, he's driven out of Naples in, in 1495 because it's just too far away, uh, uh, because he, 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 he really doesn't have the power to hang on to something that's so far away from his, 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 his French base, also because Spain starts messing with him. Isabella and Ferdinand, looking across uh, the Mediterranean, are saying, no, 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 Naples is ours, uh, not yours. They send troops, they send their very best general, they start interfering, and Charles VIII and his French forces are driven out uh, of of Naples, and they run back to France. Charles VIII has a um, perhaps uh, uh, fitting end where uh, he is going to a uh, uh, to, to be to watch a, a sporting event, kind of like a like a kind of like a combat, uh, like a tennis match. And he's while he's on the way to the tennis match, he hits his head on the door frame and dies. Seriously, he gives himself a cerebral hemorrhage by slamming his head into a low iron doorway and dies. Exit Charles VIII. Uh, but that is not Italy's salvation. Um, the, the key thing here is that the Italians, having invited the outside powers in, having invited the French, and then having incur and then the Spanish having come in a response, everyone sort of realizes now that. Italy is 
a sitting duck. Um, uh, that Italy cannot protect itself. Uh, and this is going to lead to what we call the Habsburg Valois Wars or the Italian Wars, where Italy's weakness and fragmentation lead to a series of fights with France, the Roman Empire, Spain, all of them using Italy as a battleground. The Italians are never able to pull their act together. They're never able to, to figure out how to stop these invaders. The invaders continually play one of the Italian states against each other. Um, and to show you just how sort of weak Italy becomes, um, in 1527, Emperor Charles V of the, of the Holy Roman Empire actually takes Rome and sacks it, burns it, steals all the good stuff. Um, uh, and that really is the symbol of the end of Italian power, the end of papal power. Um, it, 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 Italy is not going to really ever be, again, what it was during the Renaissance. It is replaced by these other states who have these new monarchs who are able to centralize where Italy was not. So Italy becomes uh, uh, a trophy for these big guys to fight over. That, of course, will lead us <laughs> into what happens next uh, between those big guys. And we'll pick up that story a little bit later on.